Jay's Missile Reviewed All Out Galactic War. No More Heroes 3. And finally, the moment we've all been waiting for. The final game in the 12 days of Jay's Miss. I'll just say it right off the bat, this is my personal game of the year. And if you know just how much of a Suda51 fan I am, and how much fun I had playing this game on release, that's probably not too surprising. So why is it taking me this long to review it? Well, I'll be honest, I liked the game so much, I felt intimidated about reviewing it. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to do justice to what was such an amazing experience for me. But then I realized something. I don't need to do this huge elaborate review to tell everyone how much I love No More Heroes 3. I don't need to put in a bunch of extra work doing a silly skit or stay up till sunrise multiple nights writing out an hour long review. I just have to say what I liked about it. So of course it only makes sense that I did this huge elaborate thing leading up to the review of it. What's wrong with me? In order to properly review No More Heroes 3, I'm going to have to briefly go over the previous games in the series, bite-sized versions of the reviews I never did. If you've known me for more than a day, you've probably already heard my thoughts on No More Heroes 1 and 2, so sorry in advance, but here they are again. The first No More Heroes is a fantastic game, and the main reason for this is because of Suda51's distinct style of writing, the one-of-a-kind characters that only he could create, and that unorthodox grasshopper flair that's better experience than attempting to explain. The bosses in this game are all unique and memorable in each their own way. The pre-introductions at the start of their levels give you just a taste of what's to come, with the boss's name, their silhouette, and a single voice line. This is a great setup to get you hyped for what's to come. What's that in your hand? A toy? Later, when you reach the boss, we get to see an engaging cutscene of Travis interacting with his current target, letting you get to know the ranked assassin a bit before you get to killing them. And speaking of killing them, Travis sure as hell kills them, usually in a creatively dramatic and gory fashion. I'll be frank, the actual gameplay isn't the strongest aspect of the game, but this isn't unusual for most Grasshopper titles. It seems like Suda tends to focus first and foremost on the writing, and then figuring out how to implement as many of the numerous crazy ideas he has currently floating in his head as possible. Then, he makes sure to throw in some kick-ass music, and hires various artists who often have had little to no experience in the video game industry, showcasing their art to the gaming world. Oh yeah, and then they figure out a way to make the gameplay work. In all seriousness, No More Heroes gameplay is completely serviceable, and I wouldn't call it bad by any means. It's simple to learn, and consistent for the most part. It's just a bit more rigid and shallow than what you'd probably expect from something like a AAA hack and slash game. But hey, you can suplex enemies with various pro wrestling moves, and there's the dark side special moves obtained by occasionally matching up a random slot machine chance to spice up the gameplay once in a while. There's an extremely bare-bones open world which serves as your map between different places in the game. It's where you spend most of your time as you go around doing various side jobs to earn money for your next ranking fight, mostly consisting of menial tasks that are more silly to see than they are fun to play. But then again, who said that part-time jobs were supposed to be fun? And to be honest, it is actually kind of interesting to see just how many different goofy side jobs Travis ends up doing between levels. The game may feel grindy at times, but it's never too much, and the bosses are more than enough of a reward to urge you to rack up money for the next entry fee. To go deeper into why I really enjoy this game would mean explaining a lot of very specific moments. But this is a No More Heroes 3 review, so we gotta keep this ball rolling. No More Heroes 2 is extremely similar to the first game in that it basically uses the skeleton of No More Heroes 1 as a base to work off of, but it also makes some significant tweaks which change the overall feeling of the game, in some ways better but in other ways worse. The soundtrack to the game is just as excellent as the first, while also stepping in an entirely different direction. It utilizes songs with more live instrumentation and has a generally grittier sound than the cleaner, more produced feeling soundtrack of the original. They're both great in their own way. 
The visuals have had a noticeable budget increase, and there's more details on the characters and environments this time around. Though that isn't to say the first game looks worse, both have very appealing art styles. The open world was scrapped completely, opting instead for a streamlined map menu that lets you instantly go from place to place. The entry fees have also been removed, allowing you to proceed from one ranked mission to the next whenever you feel like it. Though that doesn't mean you won't have a reason to earn money, as you can still use it to upgrade your stats at the gym and purchase new beam katanas. Replacing the wacky side jobs of the first game are these NES style mini games. You kind of lose the irony of seeing an exceptional and deadly assassin running around town doing demeaning tasks to earn cash, but most people would agree that these retro style games are a lot more fun to play overall. Some people would say that No More Hero 2's gameplay is better than the first, but I don't know if I would agree with that exactly. It's certainly flashier, and in some ways it does feel less rigid, but there's something about the second that just doesn't feel as consistent as the first for me. In No More Heroes 1, I know exactly what I have to do in order to stun and grab an opponent for a suplex, but in No More Heroes 2, it seems to be a roll of the dice on whether it'll work for me or not. I came to find out later that many of the bosses in the game can't even be grabbed at all. See, when, a, when the boss is blocking in a specific way, that was the sign in, in No More Heroes 1 to hit, hit your stun move on them to, to get into the wrestling move position. Like that, you'd think that would be it. But in this one, it doesn't work like that, and I'm not really sure how it works. Compare that to No More Heroes 1, where every boss you encounter has their own special suplex that you perform on them. For me, personally, the gameplay feels, rather than an upgrade, more like a side grade from the original. Speaking of bosses, while there were certainly some cool ranked assassins in 2, the overall roster doesn't feel quite as iconic as the ones you face off in the first game. In fact, overall, it just didn't strike me the same way that the first game did. I could maybe say it's because the writing in this game feels a bit more forcefully edgy and try-hardy than in the first one. Or I could say that there's just a lot of neat little stylistic touches in the first game that seems to be missing here, like the way that the bosses are introduced. In No More Heroes 1, as we approached a ranked fight, we get that creepy disembodied voice whispering the boss's name and the silhouette, that brief voice clip. It's quick, snappy, and gives you just enough of a taste to get you really curious about who you're about to face off against. Instead of that, in 2, before a ranking level, you just sit and hear Sylvia wax philosophical, which at times seems to tell you less about who you're about to fight, and more that she took creative writing classes in college. Most of the time, you don't even know the name of who you're fighting until after you've killed them already. It's no wonder I had trouble remembering many of these bosses after the first time I played it. I still enjoy No More Heroes 2, it has a lot of what made the first game fun, and even introduced some cool new things like playing as Shinobu and Henry for a few boss fights, but it just feels like it's missing something. And that's actually easy to explain. Suda51 had hardly any involvement in it. Yeah, he wasn't the director or even a head writer for the game, leaving the bulk of its creation to other members of Grasshopper Manufacture. I'm sure he had some of his own ideas and plot threads thrown in there, but at the time he was just too busy on the development of Shadows of the Dam to give much more creative input. But you know what Suda wasn't too busy for? You know what game saw him slamming right into the creative driver's seat as both the head writer and director for the first time in over 10 years? Well, Travis Strikes again, but also No More Heroes 3. Now I'm just gonna say very briefly that I loved Travis Strikes Again. I know it's a very divisive game for a lot of people, and I know it has its flaws, but it was the game that pushed me to buy a Switch and made me fall in love with Grasshopper Manufacture all over again. The writing, concept, and overall style of the game felt like a great resurgence for Suda. Now, I already did a 27 minute review on that game, so I'm not gonna go over it again any further than that. Let's just get to the main course. And look at that, even the Joy-Con warning screen here has that special grasshopper spin on it. You did it guys, great job. 10 out of 10, we don't even need to see anymore, 10 out of 10, come on. This is a clear sign of perfection here, come on. Okay, but seriously, I'm not exactly sure where to start, so let's just take off from the beginning and then we'll start listing a bunch of cool stuff. The intro is great. Rather than anything immediately No More Heroes specific, we hear Travis talking about a game that he used to play as a child named Deathman, while he browses clips of it on YouTube to try to remember how it ends. This may not seem like much on the surface, but this introspective conversation Travis is having with the player is important, because it tells us that this is indeed the same, somewhat more matured Travis that we first encountered in Travis Strikes Again. Hooray for committing to character growth. 
After this, we get the animation from the iconic The Return trailer, which introduces Fu as the main antagonist of the game, as well as his crew of alien space felons. Honestly, every cutscene in this game is great. It's probably the strongest part of the game, and the whole series for that matter. When it comes to the visual design of the in-game models, I do have to admit that I'm a little conflicted. I think the actual designs of the characters are still great, but the hardware does seem to struggle to do them justice, and the hair physics can be a bit crude at times. When I first jumped into the actual gameplay, I was a little worried at first. Not because I thought it was bad, but because I wasn't playing particularly great. As I continued and got more used to it, however, the gameplay felt very satisfying and the moves were very fun to pull off. I think that this game might just be a bit harder than the first two, which would explain the learning curve. The standard difficulty in 3 is even set to bitter this time, which was initially reserved as the hard difficulty in 1 and 2. As the game goes on and you gain more abilities, as well as a better mastery of the controls, I think it's safe to say that this game has the best combat in the entire series. Travis dices up enemies in a flurry of pretty strong Strikes. You can even walk while charging, which is a real game changer, and he has a perfect dodge reward system that basically gives him witch time from Bayonetta. Oh, and not only does Travis have his signature wrestling moves, check this out. Your punishing suplexes will actually recharge your beam katana, giving you a great option for keeping your momentum going during battle without having to stop to recharge manually. How sick is that? Oh, and did I mention that the jump and the death glove from TSA makes a return? Yep. Now unfortunately you only get four of the skill chips in this game, but they did make a pretty good selection. Players may also be disappointed that there's only one beam katana to use, but I personally think that all the other combat elements more than make up for it, including a number of additional special moves that you can gain from upgrading. One of the weaker aspects of No More Heroes 1 and 2 is the lack of enemy variety, mostly comprising of thug with sword, thug with gun, and occasionally big thug. Here it's an entirely different story. You have a comparatively huge array of different aliens to fight here, each with their own tricks and weaknesses. This helps avoid a lot of the monotony encountered in past entries. Each No More Heroes game has its own way of teasing upcoming bosses, and 3 is no exception. We're shown all the bosses during the opening animation, and are told their names right up front. And as a preamble before ranked fights, they do something very different as well. We see a flashback of Fu interacting with the boss that you're about to face, showing off surprisingly intimate moments between them. And when I left the shop, there was a white lighthouse. But as for where that place was, I have no idea at all. That's a nice story. Let's go out there and find that lighthouse together. I think this does a fine job letting us get to know the bosses a bit more, and even giving us a glimpse of what Fu is like when he's not in front of an audience. The open world. Look, I get it. It's not the prettiest open world. It's glitchy, it's stuttery, it's not exactly filled to the brim with content, but damn it, I think it works. One of the reasons I think it works is because of how levels are done in this game. Usually you'd have to go around town, doing tasks and side missions to build up money so you can pay for an entry fee to get into a proper level and then fight the boss, which admittedly could get a bit grindy at times. Here however, the missions you're required to do out and around the town are the proper levels, as most of the boss fights begin immediately after you've paid your entry fee. And when they don't, it's usually because there's something special going on. I think this does a great job balancing things out so it doesn't doesn't feel like you're spending too much time just mowing down normal enemies to work your way to the boss. When you're out traversing the world, you're doing multiple things at once. Sure, there isn't nearly as much interactivity as in something like GTA or Red Dead, but you are given lots of things to do. You're doing those iconic menial side jobs to make cash because that's funny, including suplexing crocodiles. You're picking up collectibles such as scorpions and death cards. You're planting trees that you can Mario 64 jump off of later. You're destroying Easter Island heads. You're playing hide and go seek with Doppelganger from TSA who's doing Jojo poses everywhere. You're blasting giant space aliens in a Gundam. The game gives you plenty of side stuff to keep you busy while you're exploring around and doing the required missions at the same time. Time. And then when you head back home, you get to immediately fight the boss. And even the bike controls in this game is a lot more fluid. It's not amazing, but it's a lot better than in one. And it's actually kind of fun to see Travis crash and fly off his bike sometimes. I can understand why people might miss the more proper boss levels that lead up to the fights, but I do think they introduced a proper alternative here. 
Besides, the most important part was always the bosses, right? And don't worry, they deliver in the boss category. The aliens all have really cool designs that stand out from one another. And minor spoiler alert, but not all the bosses you face will be the aliens. Did you always wish you could see Travis face off against the Galactic Musical Chairs champion? Well now you can. You suddenly get the urge for a genre change? Does FPS horror tickle your fancy? No. What about turn-based RPG? Yeah, this is definitely a Suda51 game. Travis's interactions with the bosses are as entertaining as ever, but at the same time, it's interesting to see an older and not so bloodthirsty Travis try to talk down a lot of the bosses before their inevitable fight, once again emphasizing how Travis has evolved. This next thing might evoke a mixed response, but they brought back the visual novel segments from TSA. These were probably my favorite thing from TSA, so as you can guess, I was very hyped about this. At this point, I feel like I need to start forming my overall thoughts about the game. I will say I had a very different idea of how I thought this game was going to be and how the final product turned out. I thought that this was going to be a proper climax to the series, something with an immense amount of finality that would finally draw the curtain to a close in a very blatant way. We didn't really get that. The game was very, very over the top in terms of the outright craziness, and that's saying a lot for Grasshopper. It's very tongue in cheek. While there are some great character moments, and they bring a lot from the previous games back into this one, including TSA, this didn't really feel like a final send-off for the series. I can't really explain why without getting into spoilers, but let's just say the game ends on this huge tease that I honestly can't tell if it's legit or just an enormous troll by Suda. Whatever the case, while the ending may not be what I expected, I had an amazing time playing through the game. I can't think of the last time I was so immersed, gleefully enjoying every bizarre cutscene and subversive moment as they happened one after another, and always hungry to see what was coming next. Fu was a fantastic rival for Travis, who was built up unlike any of the other main antagonists from the previous two games. In No More Heroes 1, the antagonist is a twist character that we only get to hear the backstory to once we've finally reached them. In 2, we have a vague idea of who the final boss is, but they end up being this flat 2D character that's really just there as endgame boss fight fodder. In 3, however, we get Fu's origins right up front. In fact, the way his story is first presented to us in the Return trailer, it's framed as if it's an entirely unique game and that Fu and his friend Damon are the protagonists, before revealing at the end that it was a No More Heroes 3 trailer the entire time. I thought that that was brilliant. Along with that, we get all these little moments between Fu and his alien buddies, which show that there's depth to his character. He may act like a cold, uncaring tyrant, and he may have some anger issues, but this dude legit cares about his friends, and he's not so keen on this beam sword otaku cutting them down. Even Fu's first confrontation with Travis is pretty crazy, with the overpowered alien completely wrecking Team Travis and giving you plenty of motivation to want to work your way to rank 1 and kick his ass. I'd argue Fu is the most fleshed out main antagonist in the whole series, save for maybe Dr. Juvenile in Travis Strikes Again. If I was being impartial, I wouldn't rate No More Heroes 3 a 10 out of 10 or even a 9 out of 10. I can even admit that the final battle with Fu might unfortunately be the most sloppily designed boss fight in the game. But for me, personally, this was the most excited I've been playing a new game for a very long time, and all the hype moments that culminate at the end of the game more than made up for it. Plus the Rocky montage with Notorious. Notorious. He is the champ after all. Whatever wavelength Suda51 is on, it hits me right in the soul. And I think anyone else that comes even close to that same wavelength is gonna have a fun time with this game too. Whatever Suda and the Grasshopper team decide to do next, I'll be waiting with open arms and an open mind. Thanks Travis, until we meet again. Alright, and that is it. End of the 12 days of Jay's Miss. Ugh. I honestly don't know how to end this because, man, this was an insane amount of work. I don't know if I'm ever going to do this again. But, uh, hope you guys enjoyed. I uh, hope you're having a great holiday. And I think it's about time I get some sleep. Till next time, everyone. <laughs>